if you have that we're being recorded yay so if you have that handy grab it if you don't you just need to run get it that's fine too i'm gonna start talking and you can run and grab your paper and scissors but i am delighted to see you this is the about maker spaces which you probably knew when you signed up and we will be having another webinar next month and at the very end there will be a slide about that so i'll tell you more about it then this is the lego me this is my my Lego picture. I love it. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Trisha Kwan. I know I've seen some of you in class. I've worked with others of you. I am a teacher at UNT right now, but I have been a librarian. I am a little bit of an inventor. I don't have time to talk about that with you tonight, but I have a couple of inventions that I'm hoping are going to maybe Get me on Shark Tank someday. You never know. <laughs> Someone's got to be on Shark Tank. It might as well be me. I am a wife and a mom. I have five kids. My oldest just graduated from college this summer. Yay! Thank you, God. <laughs> One down and two more in college. And then I have an eighth grader and a fourth grader. So it is very, very busy at my house, like a lot of your houses, I'm sure. Um, you know, it says down here that my goal is to share 100 big ideas. That's kind of a lie. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Usually when I talk about maker spaces, I do like a full day, six hours, and we do share 100 ideas. But you know, if we do all six hours, that's going to have us finishing about 1 a.m., which if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but I was like, well, that might just be a little extreme. So we're just going to touch the tip of the iceberg tonight. There is so much that we could talk about. Even in six hours, we can't talk about it all. So there's so much that we can't talk about tonight. But I'm going to try to just give you a few highlights of things that have been really meaningful to me in my journey with makerspaces. And let me say, this doesn't mean that this is how everyone has to do it, because there are so many ways to do it. But I'll just share a little bit about what I have seen. And I want to give you a little background information too, because some of you may be completely new to makerspaces. Maybe you've never used them before. And you don't even quite really know what they are. So we're going to start at the beginning with what is a makerspace. That's where I started when I was a librarian. I was working in elementary school and I said, I want to do makerspaces this year, but I didn't really know much about them. I had read some things that I didn't know as much as I wanted to know. So I started doing research and you know we're really good at research as librarians. And the more I read, the more confused I got. <laughs> because it was kind of like this little guy trying to catch a fish with your bare hands. Everyone had a different opinion about what is a maker. Some people said, oh, well, it's a fab lab. You need a 3D printer and you need soldering irons and you need laser cutters and lots of robotics and it was tech, right? Well, I didn't have any money. Um, and my, some, my internet connection may be a little wonky every now and then. So if I freeze, don't worry, I'll be back. <laughs> so I said, well, on the other end, there were people who, space extremely fancy so as I read more and more and I'm sorry if I froze for a second you guys because I see some of you froze too as I read more and more I started to realize that there were similarities in every definition so I'm going to show you a couple of definitions of maker spaces that really stood out for me this is one. Laura Fleming wrote a book called Worlds of Making, and I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, you should, because it's a great book. I'm not going to read the definition to you, but I do like what she had to say about tools, virtual and physical tools that are used to build creative projects. So if you think about that, what are physical tools? That could be almost anything that you can touch, right? Scissors, paper, tape, duct tape. You've got pipe cleaners, paper clips, clothespins, all of those things. Those are all physical tools where you could actually make something that is a physical representation. 
And what about digital tools or virtual tools? Augmented reality, you know you can actually make your own augmented reality. There are apps for that now, it's amazing. I'll show you something like that later. What about virtual reality? And all the things that we learn on computers and on apps, those are all virtual tools and they are great for using in maker spaces. This little unicorn, I'm showing you him because I was shopping on the Target app. Do we have some Target shopping? shoppers here tonight. Okay, so I was shopping on the Target app and I wanted to know, you know, usually you can't tell how big something is and the dimensions they say in inches or centimeters and I'm like, oh, I don't even know what that means. And it said, would you like to see this in augmented reality? And I said, yes. <laughs> and what it did is it plopped this little unicorn down right on my ottoman in my living room, like on my phone. So I could see what it would look like if it were sitting there right in front of me. It was amazing. I mean, like the angels were singing, Whoa! it was so cool. I said, oh, this is you know, this is the way to shop, right? You've got to be able to see it in augmented reality. But that is like where we are. There are so many great digital tools. So always keep those in mind. And I'm gonna show you a few of my favorites here in a little while. All right, this is another definition. I love this first line. Imagine do-it-yourself meets education. So are any of you do-it-yourselfers? Oh, Ashley's a do-it-yourselfer. Good. Anyone else? You, yeah, Angela. Okay, good. I like to think of myself as a do-it-yourselfer. I'm like, I can do it. Why don't I just, if you know why hire someone? <laughs> if I can do it, I can figure it out, right? So I have done some, I have fixed the garbage disposal multiple times. <laughs> I learned how to do that a long time ago. Probably the hardest thing I've ever done though is I retiled a whole floor and I pulled up the carpet and I got the concrete all the way. It's supposed to be filled in holes and retiled the floor. And it took me about two weeks. And at the end of that two weeks, I could barely walk. <laughs> and it is such hard work. But during that two weeks, I had never done this before, right? I didn't know anyone to talk to, except the people at Home Depot who started avoiding me by about the third day. But I would just go down there and say, okay, this is what I need to know. And when they stopped talking to me, I was on YouTube and I was just researching, how do I do this? What do I do? That week though, that I was working out that two weeks, my brain was like on fire. Because when you are doing something yourself, you are learning an immense amount and it's just lighting up all these neurons in, in your brain that you've never used before. The great thing about learning that way is you never forget it and it can work for you the next time. So if I needed to retile a floor again, it would just be like that because I remember exactly what to do. It's like I have, I have not forgotten it which is amazing. So do-it-yourself meets education. This is what makerspaces do for us. We have do-it-yourself projects. We combine them with what we're learning in school and suddenly students start remembering what we taught them, <laughs> which is great because you know a lot of times we have to reteach things over and over and over and over. Why do we have to do that? because they forget. <laughs> and that's just how our brains are made. It's not just kids, it's us too. We are not made to remember. And I'll show you an infographic in a minute about that. We're not made to remember not the way we teach, but when we learn something by doing, we remember it. So something really important to keep in mind. Now this is my definition. And I'll just, I'm just gonna read this to you because I wanna point out these bold parts. It can be a designated space, but I have known people to have a maker space without a designated space. If you have a cart or a, a grocery buggy or a baby buggy, you can have a maker space too. If you have a way to store some materials, you can have a maker space. I have known people who didn't have a really designated space in their library, but they could have a maker space. The mindset though is the more important. And when I say maker mindset, what do you think I'm talking about? Think about that for a second. What is a maker mindset? Let's think about that. A maker mindset. 
And I'm, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, but I'll probably wait and answer questions at the very end. But if you want to answer the question now in the chat, you can. Oh, Marco pays people. He's not a do-it-yourself guy. <laughs> what do you think I mean by a maker mindset? That's an interesting idea, isn't it? A maker mindset. It's really about an attitude. It's really about an I can do this if I keep working at it. I open-mindedness, Michael says, absolutely. And Nellie said, I can do it in, and I want to do it. Motivation is the key. You probably all heard of growth mindset. This is very similar to growth mindset. A maker mindset, in fact, builds growth mindset. With growth mindset, we know that a lot of times students don't like to do things that are hard. If it's hard for them, they might feel foolish or like they don't look smart and people don't want to look don't want to look not smart it's not just kids it's us too so a lot of times people will not try things that are a little bit harder because they're afraid of failing but we need to embrace failing right we are going to fail. <laughs> There's just no option other than failing. It is going to happen. We need to give students those opportunities to fail. And maker spaces are like a really safe way to provide opportunities to keep trying to, oh, it didn't work that time. What are you going to do next time? You've got to try again. And that th those failing opportunities just make them say, okay, I figured out one more way. This doesn't work, but I'm going to keep trying. So I think you all, all of your ideas are right on. That mindset is so important. Materials are also important. And remember, they can be physical or virtual, and you're producing some kind of product. Now this could be a physical product, but it could even just be like expanded brain capacity. I mean, let's think about that for a second. Sometimes you get on an app or on a computer program and you learn new information or a new way to do something, but you're not really producing a product at all. But you did expand your understanding of a content area or something like that. So that expanded brain capacity is also really important and something that definitely happens in maker spaces. I love David Lurcher. He's like my library hero. So David Lurcher came up with the idea of the library commons idea and really revolutionized the idea of what a library is. It's we yes, it's a place for books, but it's also a place for all kinds of collaboration and sharing. It's a place for students to come in and use the space for any kind of learning, not just students, but patrons in the public library as well. And he has also done a lot of research on maker spaces. And he, I love his language here. He talks about it as a frontier in the evolution of libraries. It's kind of very Star Trek. And I like Star Trek. <laughs> so, so I love that idea, though. It's, it's part of the evolution of libraries. And I have the article linked for you here in a minute, but, but basically what he means by that is libraries have always been a place where we stored information in the form of books. Now with technology, we also use a lot of technology. So we store a lot of information and we're a resource for lots of information, but now we're also creating new information and creating new learning experiences through maker spaces. So that is part of that evolution. Now David Literature also has a very in-depth definition of the educational benefits. So he lists nine educational benefits of using maker spaces. And I'm just going to show these to you sometimes when in fact one question I got on the padlet that we'll talk about later is is how do you justify maker spaces because some people say it just looks like you're playing and and playing is part of it that is definitely part of it and it's an important part of it so how do you justify it that's where these educational benefits come in there are so many great educational benefits and there's a lot of good research to back it up so if you feel like you want to do maker spaces, but you're not sure about justifying, you feel free to use this information. And I'll give you this PowerPoint. And I'll show you where to find it in a little bit too. But let's look at these. So opportunities for mentoring. Now this could be student to student, teacher to student, all different kinds of mentoring. If you know how to do something, 
um, Angela, if you knew how to do tile that week, that two weeks that I was doing tile on my floor, you could have helped me a lot. <laughs> you could have saved me a lot of time and energy and probably money because there were, a, a, you know, major mistakes along the way that I made. So having a mentor is invaluable. Also, an educational benefit is experimenting, figuring out how to do something and how not to do it. We mentioned the growth mindset and the importance of the growth mindset. Maker spaces give us those opportunities to build the growth mindset. It also builds on multiple learning styles, not very many things that we do in school use multiple learning styles, but with maker spaces, we use all of them. It can definitely be linked to the curriculum, and it should be, and in a few minutes, I'll show you how I use it in the library. It can be used, it's almost always STEM and STEAM related. Almost anything you do with makerspaces is going to use science, technology, engineering, art, and math in some way. So that's awesome because right now, and always, that's probably always going to be something that's valued in school. It definitely combines formal learning, which is where you have an objective, you have exactly what you're planning students to learn with informal learning, and that's all the amazing things they learn that you weren't planning on them learning, <laughs> but it's a lot. Usually it's bigger than what your formal objective is. The five C's. What are the five C's? The five C's, you can write them in the chat. We'll see if we can name them all. So at, the, at about 2000, the National Education Association did a massive study and they asked employers who were getting graduates coming out of high school and college working for them, what skills do you see lacking in the graduates, the people that you're hiring. Yes, critical thinking is one, good. There were five words that begin with the letter C. And one of them was critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, good, two more, communication, one more. The, the other one was added a little bit later and it doesn't have a hard C sound, it's a S, like an S sound. So we have collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and communication. What do you think it is? You know what, here in Keller, we have a grade on our report cards for this. It's kind of related to behavior. Yes, citizenship. <laughs> That's it. So citizenship, communication, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking. Those five things, employer said, you know what, people will have a hard time with problem solving. If I tell them exactly what to do, they can do it. They also don't work well together. They don't collaborate. In fact, you know, if you've ever taught high school, which a lot of us have, and you give out a group project, what usually happens? One person does all the work, right? Because people aren't good at collaborating. They need those opportunities, don't they? They need those opportunities to work together. So employer said these five skills are really needed. This is where another place where maker spaces can fill a huge need by allowing students those opportunities to experience those five C's. It's just very important. Then you see number nine, problem solving, which is closely related to critical thinking. Um, problem solving. I noticed the last time I was in the elementary school, most of the kids wear shoes with Velcro on them or no shoelaces. And, and what I learned is that people stop learning to tie their shoes, <laughs> which is kind of a little thing, right? But but it's it's not that easy to tie your shoes, honestly. I mean, when you're first learning, but we used to learn that before we went to kindergarten. What I'm seeing now is that a lot of kids are just not ever learning that and they're not having to. It's like, well, we can get around that. We can just not buy shoes. But let's let's just be honest. Has anyone not bought shoes for your kids that, that had laces for just that reason? Because it's hard to tie them. I have. <laughs> I'm guilty. Yeah, I went for the Velcro. There was a time I was like, okay, we just can't have these laces. That's just a small example. But if you think about it, problem solving is, is so necessary. In fact, if you think about it, most of the jobs that our kids will have are students that we have in school, no matter what level they are, most of the jobs they're going to have in the future have not even been invented yet. So a lot of what we're teaching them, you know, 
may or may not help them, but those five C's and problem solving is that's going to help them no matter what profession they end up in. So they need those opportunities to build those skills. Okay, so this is an interesting infographic. If you look at this, it's kind of shocking. Um, only 10% of what we learn formally, like reading books and training like this, you're only going to remember 10% of this <laughs> tonight. And that's, you, you can't help it. If I gave you a quiz at the end of this, you probably would not remember more than 10 or 20% of it at the end of the, the hour. And that is just the way our brains work. 20% of what we learn from others like coaches and mentors, we remember, 20%. But 70% of what we learn by doing, we remember. That's amazing, 70%. That means our brains want to learn that way. Our brains want to learn by doing. And this is here again where maker spaces can make a huge difference. All right, so now we're gonna talk about David Lurcher's model for using maker spaces. I like this model a lot. There are lots of models, but I like it because it's easy to remember. I teach it to kids. It's easy for me to remember. And it's something that helps guide me. And if you look at it, you say, well, do you need to use a model? Here are some of the reasons why I think it's important to use a model when you're doing maker spaces. One, it guides you. It's kind of like goals. You know where you're going and you know why you're going there if you have some kind of framework or model that you're using. It also provides lots of opportunities to think about your learning and for students to think about their learning. It provides a hierarchy. We need to start by building a foundation and then move up to higher skills. If you think about like um, Bloom's taxonomy, which we start with lower level skills and move up higher, the higher level things like evaluation and synthesis are a little bit deeper thinking, in fact, a lot deeper thinking. The same is true with the UTEC model. So it provides a hierarchy. So we start by building a foundation and then we move up to more intense types of thought. It also helps us to focus on learning through making. And once you start thinking in these terms, like what can we make to go with this lesson, it becomes really easy. But you just have to start. The, the main thing is just getting your toe in the water and starting. Now this is a picture of what the model looks like. And you can see the U is for using, the T is for tinkering, the E is for experimenting, and the C is for creating. So we want to start with using. Now think about it like this. If I gave you all Legos and I said make something with the Legos, that would just be you using the Legos. It can also be direct instruction. If I had us make paper airplane together and you followed my steps and you did what I did, that would just be using. If we wanted to move up a level to tinkering, let's say with your Legos, I said, now I want you to make the seven wonders of the world. And I want you to do it like as a group. And there are 44 of you here tonight. Well, this would change your thinking. Your thoughts would have to go to a little bit more research. Some of you might be like, I don't even know what the seven wonders of the world are. You'd have to do some research and figure that out. So we're leveling up a little bit when we go to tinkering. Now with experimenting, this is where we're actually trying and failing and building something until we get to the creation level where we've created or we've tweaked something in a new way. So the, the idea is to get to creation. Creating something brand new or changing something in a significant way, that's where we want to head. But we have to start with using and tinkering. Now this is the part that looks like playing because really you're just using all kinds of materials to experience using those materials because it's hard to move up to the higher stages if you don't first have the foundation. It's just like when you're building a house. You have to have a foundation first. You can't just build the house on the dirt, right? You have to first have a firm foundation. Think of using and tinkering as that firm foundation. And then once you have that foundation, you can move up. Also, because this is a continuum, tinkering and experimenting, for instance, can look kind of alike, you know, because there's, there's like overlap. So same with using and tinkering, they can overlap a little bit. That's okay. That's good. That's how it's meant to be. So don't worry about that. 
Now my tweak to this model is I use some gamer terminology and I say leveling up and I say to students, how can we level this up? So we're doing a using or tinkering activity. How could we level this up and make it more deep thought like experimenting and creating? Don't feel like you have to do all the work ask the students to do it for you. So I ask them, tell me what to do. And then you can get some ideas. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here's some kindergartners on the left and they're just playing with the marble run. So this is using. They are using and, and maybe even tinkering. This is an already existing set and they are making something with it. Over on the right, this is a marble, same marble run, same type of marble run, but this was made by high school students. So this one was about 20 to 25 feet tall, very tall. So what the high school students could create was very different than what the elementary students. So when I asked them, how can you level this up? So you're using your tinkering, with this existing model and you're learning a lot about engineering and how to make something what what are you going to do to level up and let's take a look at what they came up with so here on the left is is at their own making their own marble run with paper towel holders and craft sticks and they use tacky glue and tape on the right the high schoolers made their own marble run with paper and tape just paper and tape, and that was all they used. So they said, you know, we kind of understand the design basics after using the materials that we had. Now we can take other materials and we can create our own designs. So that was how they moved up from using and tinkering to experimenting and creating. And here's another example. Let's say you have this lovely loom that's already made. It's a wooden loom. And then you say, okay, how could you level up? What could you do to level this up from using and tinkering with an already existing loom to experimenting and creating? They said, well, what about these? We have these old DVDs lying around. What if we make a loom with those? And so one group in the elementary made the beautiful yarn loom here in the middle. And then in the high school, another group said, let's use Plarn. So Plarn is plastic yarn. So it's yarn made from plastic bags, which there are a lot of recipes online for how to do that. So they made Plarn and then made little like coasters uh, with the same thing, the DVD. So they just wove the plarn, made their own little looms with the DVDs, and it worked great. That was a really good way to level up, though. Both groups thought of ways to level up. All right, now some of you, and I got this question in the Padlet, too, some of you wonder, why are we doing this in the library? And I think it's a great question. In fact, when I first started, that was the question I asked myself, is this going to take away a lot of my time and attention from my main priority, which is getting kids excited about reading? And the answer is it is gonna take some of your time, definitely, because you do have to spend time on it. It is gonna be part of your collection. The good news is the benefits are so immense that it's worth it. In fact, within about two months of starting using maker spaces in my first, the first place I used them in my elementary library, my circulation doubled. And I already had a busy library. So that was amazing to me. I was like, wow, this was a great way to reach people and to make them wanna keep coming back, which you know was part of the goal, right? We want them to keep coming back. So of course, David Lurcher mentioned the evolution of libraries. Also, if you think about it, we're on the cutting edge. We also use a lot of technology. That's something we weren't always planning to do in the library. But when technology came along, guess what? <laughs> Hello, librarians. You're our new technology experts because we're very good at researching and learning new things. We also provide a lot of resources. Makerspaces can be one of those resources that we provide to teachers. So I've gotten to where over the years, I started by just using Makerspaces with students, and then I started checking out Makerspace materials to teachers so that they, I know I'd slap a barcode on a tub and say, here you go, take this too. And they could make they could do their own activities in their classrooms because it's so good I didn't want anyone to miss out on the opportunities. Of course it can lead to research which is so important and 
another thing we teach in the library. It definitely will increase your book circulation. I'm not kidding. I know you may think that sounds crazy, but it, and it is crazy, but it does happen. And it will bring those new users into the library. So there are lots of great reasons to use it in the library. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at, at what can be done like with just a piece of paper. <laughs> and there's a lot you can do with just a piece of paper. So whenever I think about using maker spaces in the library, of course I have I start with books because usually I have lessons to teach, I have different standards that I have to hit on, and I'm using a book of some kind. So I try to find books to use that cover lots of bases for me. And Snowflake Bentley is one of those books that I love. Now this this uh, term book and build was something that one of my former students and her name is Jamie Wright came up with this and I said, can I use that? I love that. And she said, yes. So I'm giving her credit for it. But if you think about the book Snowflake Bentley, let's just take a quick look at some of the pictures. There's a lot of great lessons in Snowflake Bentley. It won the Caldecott Medal. So I can talk about book awards when I talk about Snowflake Bentley. It's a biography when it's a fun biography and an interesting biography. So I use it to talk about biographies with kids when I'm talking about genres. There are some great themes in Snowflake Bentley. A lot about growth mindset. Snowflake Bentley would not give up. He was very determined. And also there, there are lessons about individuality because the things that Snowflake Bentley discovered about the snow in the book were very closely related to how we are all individuals just like snowflakes are all individual. So if you look at the picture, Snowflake Bentley had a dream and he wanted to know more about the snow, which is so interesting to me. He had a microscope and he would capture snowflakes and he would try to draw pictures of them. But of course, the flake would melt and he couldn't ever get a picture. So he convinced his parents as he grew up that, and they believed in him so much that they basically mortgaged their farm in order to buy this special camera for him so that he could take pictures of the snow. And that is what he did. And here is him, it took him two years to finally get a decent picture of the snow. If you think about that, that is crazy two years, but he did not give up. He was so determined. And he learned things about the snow that no one had ever known before. And he traveled all over the world teaching people about the snow. And this is an actual photo that he took. He learned that all snowflakes have six arms. And he learned that no two snowflakes are alike. Among other things, so when I think about the UTEC model, and you might remember that U is for using, we're gonna make snowflakes together. I say, okay, using, this is gonna be fun. So if you have your piece of paper, get your piece of paper, and you see here on the screen, this is a diagram of how we're going to fold the paper. Now, this is like really beginning origami, and origami is so good for you. <laughs> origami uses both sides of your brain, your left and your right brain, which means the two sides have to talk to each other, which basically means you get a lot smarter and you build these pathways in your brain. So it's so good for you. Now, I have a rectangle and I need to make a square. So I'm going to take my paper and I'm going to fold it. Let me look at it here. I'm going to fold it like this. And then I'm going to cut this piece off the bottom because what I want is a square. So if you have a triangle and you have two sides of a triangle, that's going to make a square. So cut off that piece and I'm going to cut off my piece. And then you have a square. All right. So there's a square. Now number step two says to fold your square in half. So do that, good. And then step three says to fold it again. So now you're gonna fold your triangle in half one more time. And it's nice to have really good creases. 
the better your creases are, the easier this next step is going to be. This next step is the only hard part, y'all. Everything else is easy. This step, you need to take this triangle and basically you're going to fold it into thirds. So do you see where the lines are, the dotted lines are? If you could imagine drawing dotted lines the same way it is, it looks on step four, basically you want your folds to be where those dotted lines are. Let me do it and then I will show you what it looks like on my paper. And you want the two sides to line up perfectly when you're done folding. So here it is, step four. So I would fold it like a burrito. Drunch, drunch. And these two sides line up, and you want these two sides to line up perfectly. So let me open it up. You see that? So you start at this side, like this, and like this. And that is, then you're at step five. So if you get there, show me. I want to see if you are able to get to this step. Oh yes, William's got it, good. Who else has it? Good, Jackie's got it. And sometimes you have to play with it a few times to get those two edges to line up. But when you do, then you want to cut off this bottom part. You can see that's step six. So you're gonna take your scissors and you're gonna cut off that bottom part. So cut that off. And now you have this little guy. And now you're ready to start cutting. Now along the edge, this is going to be what the, the outer edge of your snowflake is going to look like. In the middle is going to be where, where you're cutting in the middle. So go ahead and start cutting. I'm gonna show you this computer program and you just cut, but I'll show you how this works. It's pretty cool. And hopefully it'll open here, yay. All right, so, and, and the, yes, I'm gonna use it once. So, um, and this is going to be in the presentation to this link. So if you ever want to use it in the future. So this looks just like this. So I can use my little cursor and I can basically make little cuts. So if I wanted to do hearts over here, and then maybe, I don't know, I want to do an angel. And then I say create. There's what it's going to look like when I open it up. So this is like tinkering and experimenting. I'm trying to figure out what do I want my snowflake to look like? And then if I say resume and reset, it goes back. So then I could try something else. So I like to have students play with this program, this computer program, before they actually make a cut because then they might be able to, you know, design something and say, oh yeah, that wasn't what I really wanted, but I like this. So like, let's say I wanna do a Christmas tree. There's that, and maybe I'm going to do a snowman on the other side. And then I say create, that's what it would look like when I open it up. And then I can say resume and reset. It's very easy to use, but it gives you that nice visual so you have an idea what your snowflake is going to look like before you make it. Did anyone finish your snowflake? I'm gonna make one real quick. Let's see. And the nice thing about this is everyone ends up having something that looks different from everyone else. And these can be very elaborate or not. <laughs> it just depends on how much time you want to spend cutting them. Students can get really creative with it though. Okay, so now I've got mine cut. I'm going to open it up and let's see what it looks like.
All right. Okay, who else has a snowflake? I want to see, oh, nice, Jackie. Beautiful, Jackie's got a snowflake. All right, and when everyone makes a snowflake, they all end up looking very different because we are all individuals. So when I did this at my school, then I hung up everyone's snowflake. Ashley, that looks beautiful. Very nice. <laughs> and I, I hung up everyone's snowflake. So we had 900 snowflakes hanging in the library all winter. Because as you know, this is the only way we get snow in Texas. <laughs> there is no snow. <laughs> Where is the snow? Darn it. But yes. It looks beautiful. And you might say, well, they were hanging kind of low. Would the kids try to pull them down? No, because they wanted to see the snow. So I just had to say, you know, if you pull them down, then we won't have them. And they didn't even try, but it looked really beautiful. And every single snowflake was very individual, just like the story says, because no two snowflakes are alike. So this was a very simple experiment, a very simple creation where every Everyone got to make a snowflake. We went through the steps of the UTEC model and I and we talked about well what what step is this? What step is this? What step is this? As we went and it didn't take a lot of time but it linked us to the story which helps the students remember Snowflake Bentley which was really what I wanted. I wanted them to remember the story. Now you might think what else could we do with the snow? That's a question I asked them. Let's experiment. What else could we do with the snow? No. What, what else could we create? So I asked students to give me ideas. They said, let's make snowflakes with other things. There are lots of things you can use to make snowflakes. Really, the sky is the limit, right? I mean, almost anything you could use to make snowflakes. So now this was used with, this was a laser cutter in high school. So, you know, you can't necessarily do that in elementary, but at the high school, yes. And it turns out beautiful. I love the one on the right made with hangers, with buttons and discarded books. Don't throw away those discarded books. You can use them in your maker space. <laughs> Don't forget, the one on the right was made with a 3D printer. Great for making all kinds of things, including snowflakes. And then one group of kids said, well, what if we actually make snow? Let's find snow recipes and then let's have a competition to see which recipe we think makes the best snow. And that was a lot of fun and a lot of learning, a lot of problem solving, working together, all those five C's. It was like magic. So, it, and they'll never forget it. It was, it, it definitely met my goal. So when you think about, and if we had time tonight, I'd have you write down goals for your makerspace. You need to have goals because your goals, just like any kind of framework or model are going to guide you. So I'm going to show you my goals and I always think three goals we're not going to share in small groups because we don't have time to do that but I always think three goals are good and make it simple <laughs> you want to be able to remember your goals so one of my goals is opportunities to use the five c's I think the five c's are so important so collaboration communication creativity critical thinking and citizenship those five goals are so important I want students to have lots of opportunities so when I develop a makerspace activity I say does it use the five C's? That's my first question. Goal number two is fostering a maker mindset. Now this can lead to a lot of problem solving and inventing. And look at this. This was a student, a middle school student created this, this um, ice cream cone catcher. So what was the problem she was trying to solve? She was trying to solve a problem. Most of the time we're trying to solve a problem when we create something. What was her problem? Her problem was that the ice cream was melting onto her hand. So she said, what if I just put a cool catcher on the ice cream cone? And you can see through the picture, she made this with a Dixie cup and Play-Doh on top. She took this to an adventure fair and she ended up getting a deal with an ice cream cone company. 
to actually manufacture these. There are, in fact, a lot of kid inventors. They Kids think outside the box, and it's not hard for them <laughs> to be really creative. So there's lots of opportunities. But this is a goal of mine, fostering that maker mindset. This leads to a lot of problem solving, as I mentioned, which is really the scientific method, which is also the engineering design process. There really is nothing new under the sun. All three of those processes are really the exact same thing. So using those is like gold for students. It's one of the most important things we can do with students. And then my third goal is to use the UTech process to build that foundation with using and tinkering, and then to encourage higher level thinking with experimenting and creating. So everything I do, I keep those three goals in mind. How can I meet those goals? with this activity. Now I wanna show you my website really fast because a lot of things that we can't talk about tonight are on my website because we just don't have time to talk about everything. The website is trishaquan.com. So if you go to trishaquan.com and you look under makerspaces, right here. And Marco, thank you for the amazing presentation last month because it really inspired me to work on my website, <laughs> which I had been needing to do. But if I click here on Makerspaces, and sorry, my internet's being a little slow. I have a lot of links under Makerspaces. Come on, open up. And I think I have 12 or 13, which may be a little too many, but you know, it's just there's so much good information to share. Let me try again and see if it'll open up a little bit better this time because I want to show you just a couple of things so that you can come back and look at these things on your, okay, there it is. So if where it says BER Makerspace PowerPoint, this is where I have a very long version. That's This is the six hour version, which is like 200 pages. And, and you can, if you click there, it'll take you to a link. This is the PowerPoint I'm sharing with you tonight, which is a much shorter version. And if you look here too, you can see book and build. These are all ideas for using books and then doing making activities. And I love the Simbaloo and making the web mixes. So that's what I did. These are all book titles. If you click on these, it'll take you to a website with design, with ideas for making related to that book title. So these are lots of book and build activity ideas, which I think there were, I don't know, there's more than 50 on that page. So just keep that in mind. And then UTech ideas. We're talking about the UTEC process and the UTEC model. So these are ideas for U's and then T's, then the E and the C. And this right here where it says UTEC model, that's David Lurcher's actual article. I recommend that you read it. It's fabulous. So good. So, so, so good. And you won't be sorry if you do. Then there's more making ideas. And here where it says at home primary, I know a lot of you are going to be teaching online. So, so if you have students and you want them to be doing maker spaces from home, these resources will be great for you. So we have primary for elementary, secondary for middle school and high school. So let's just take a look at the primary real quick. What this is, is over here on the left side, you have, watch this read aloud. So we have Pete the Cat, okay? So elementary students love Pete the Cat. So they can watch this. This is a read aloud of someone reading the book aloud on YouTube. And then they can come over here and create a project from home. And all of these projects are simple projects with simple materials that students will already have at home. And I think there's about 25 of these read alouds on each of those pages. Now for the high school page, the high school middle school page, it's not read alouds. Instead, what I have is like a video that explains a concept and then they get to make their own version. So augmented reality books, what are augmented reality books? So here's a video to learn more about augmented reality. And then here are instructions to make your own augmented reality, which is really cool. <laughs> I think it's such a great idea. I can't wait to do it myself. Digital resources and apps for making, there are so many good ones. And here again, I went crazy 
Thank you, Marco, with the web mix. <laughs> and made another one. These are just all digital re resources to use for making. And so fun. It's a great way to level up whatever activity you're doing, level up with those digital tools. And then there's Makerspace websites. And the I only link to websites that I think are really good with lots of good information. If they only have one or two ideas and it's been five years since they created another idea, I don't bother with it. It's got to have lots of good ideas that are updated regularly. Then here are books about maker spaces, children's literature. So this is descriptions of all of those books that were on the book and build page. These are descriptions of those books in case you want to know what the book is about. These are ideas for creating the space. And there's a lot of great articles and pictures in that link. And then of course, organizing is important. How are we going to organize the materials? Where are we going to put it, all of those things. Then the materials, what materials are you going to use? That's important. Fundraising, how are you going to pay for it? <laughs> That's important too, especially if you're like me and started with no money, <laughs> zero dollars. I was like, how am I going to do this? So there are some good ideas for getting money. It doesn't cost you anything. And then we have FAQs. And I'm going to answer a couple of questions because on the Padlet, we had these questions come in. So I'm going to answer these. And if you have other questions, I'm what I'm planning to do is do short videos to answer each question, but feel free to email me any questions that you have and I will answer them and put them on my frequently asked questions page because um, we just have an hour tonight. So I know we won't have a lot of time to answer every question that you might have. But also anytime you want to talk about maker spaces, I love talking about it. <laughs> so we can do a Zoom meeting or you can email me and I'm happy to talk to you about it as much as I can. But let's take a look at these questions. I thought these were great questions. How do we gain support from administration and teachers? This is really important. I always recommend at the beginning of the school year that you do professional development for teachers and you tell them what maker spaces are and why you're using them. Otherwise, you're going to get those comments like, what well, must be nice to just play all day in the library with Legos, <laughs> which you know is not true. But if they understand what you're doing, which is really important and the educational benefits, a lot of this is just education. People don't always understand, right? So you need to tell them. Also, once they start seeing how much kids like it and love it and learn from it, then you can start helping them start their own maker spaces in their classrooms too with teachers. So I just think education is the most important thing. Um, I've been given the chance to develop it and I'm looking for functional furniture and storage. If I could design my own space, what a gift, I would go with shelving on wheels that can be easily moved. Same with tables. At the elementary level, most kids like to stand up at the table to do maker spaces. At the higher levels, middle school, school and high school they prefer to sit but at the elementary level it's perfect standing they they would prefer to stand while they do maker spaces so so I would I mean the more flexible your seating and your shelving can be the better I love sturdy plastic see-through tubs <laughs> the, and spend money on tubs. I know we don't like to spend money, but they will last better. If you spend a little bit, you can store so much in those tubs. So I highly recommend tubs of different sizes. Um, you know, right now I've seen some pencil cases on sale for 10 cents a piece. When that happens, I just go buy a hundred of them because those are great for even making little maker space kits that you can send home when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> where you can put a barcode on them and let students check those out. They love it. So now there are a lot more ideas too on that question under the space and materials. So, so, but that's my brief answer there. How do you make a makerspace safe in this COVID world? This is a great question. I've, I've thought about this a lot because this is a problem we're going to have, right? It's everywhere we go. It's a problem we all have. So, I recommend, of course, you're going to have to sanitize a lot. Some things you may not be doing, like using a lot of Legos, because you can't sanitize them every time someone touches them. <laughs> you just can't. I mean, paper 
is going to be your friend, right? The things you can do with paper where everyone gets their own piece, and this is really cheap, those kind of activities. Also, you can do a lot of designing where students are thinking about functions and drawing, those kind of things. Um, another possibility, you can, for $10 on Amazon, you can buy 500 gloves, plastic gloves, disposable. And if students are wearing their mask and wearing gloves, they can use the maker spaces. So that might be a way, that's how I would do it. Honestly, I would go with plastic gloves and throw them away. Now this of course may depend on what kind of budget you have. If you don't have money for that, ask the PTA, they're always loaded. I worked at a Title I school and I don't know where, the PTA has tons of money. So ask them first if they will buy gloves for you to use. Because because if students have gloves on and masks, they should be able to use the materials. But this is going to be really interesting to see how it goes, right? And we just want to be as safe as we possibly can. But a great question. Then why do makerspaces and libraries seem to go hand in hand? I love that question. It's because we're so amazing. <laughs> Librarians are the best. We really are resource people, right? We are in the helping profession. We are there to help everyone. And if you if you think about it, have you ever watched librarians on Jeopardy? Because librarians always win. They always win on Jeopardy because they know so much about so many things. And that's because we are the go-to resource. If there's something that has to be learned and and a, and you know, maker spaces are one of these kind of more new cutting edge tools for teaching so it makes a lot of sense plus the library is the biggest classroom in the building your library is a classroom it's just a lot bigger than some of the other classrooms and and so it makes sense that we would store those kind of materials and have those kind of experiences in the library if you're reluctant to try making to try maker spaces, don't be. You'll love it. Once you get in there and get started, you will be like, oh my gosh, this is like the best thing I ever did. And I'm not kidding, you will love it. If you had to start a maker space on a budget, what would you recommend? So this is a great question. Number one, if you go to this fundraising page, there are great ideas on there for how to get materials. The first thing I do is ask for donations. And I would send a note home with every student, both a printed copy and an electric copy that I would send. And I would tell parents, here's what we're doing and why. We're using maker spaces. This is why we're using them. I would have a list of 100 things, things that they could donate, things like toilet paper rolls, you know, paper, markers do you have a new ipad laying around because <laughs> we could use it it's you can ask for anything sometimes people it's amazing what people have you know so many people have like a thousand craft sticks in their closet and they would be willing to donate those to you or magazines whatever it is you need if you just ask for it people will start sending it Three times I've had people write me checks for $500. So say we accept donations too, <laughs> you know, and people will, if they believe in what you're doing and they want to support the school, they will also give money. So fundraising, look at those ideas. But also, as far as materials, if you come here to this page on materials, there are some really great articles too. And you'll have to scroll down because these are my suggestions for materials that I've used and really loved. But if you scroll down past these, all of these are links to articles that have more information about, about inexpensive materials that you can get and how you can get them. I know and when I worked in Keller, we had a warehouse and you could get materials really cheap there, extremely cheap. But there are a lot of other options and some of these articles have really great ideas. And Sherry said, no supply budget, no PTA, so it's out of our pocket. Uh, yes, a Facebook post to friends, absolutely. It's amazing the things people have laying around that they would be willing to donate. So, oh my gosh, we have one minute left. That was like the fastest talking ever. So, does anyone have one more question? Because we could do one more question before the clock strikes eight. And if you, if you do have a question that comes up later, please feel free to email me. My email address is 
Trisha, T R I C I A dot Quan at G, I'm sorry, at UNT dot edu. And I'm not going to tell you the rain hat story because I don't have time, but I do want to tell you that there is going to be a webinar next month and you can register for it now or you can register for it later but oh this is not next month this is the wrong slide but if you go back to the multi-literacy lab you can see the the webinar that's going to be happening next month sarah do you have a link in yeah um i will put a link in um you keep talking for a minute and i will get the description okay Okay, Sarah is going to put a link in the chat. I'm trying to remember who's doing it next month. Do you remember, Sarah? It's Daniela. I just um, Dr. I think it's on my presentation. So let me. Um, okay, and then the month after, um, Dr. Schultz Jones will be doing a presentation. Actually, that'll be me. If um, you're a student, you can use these for your practicum hours too. So make sure to count this, you know, on your mentor timesheet because you know every hour counts, so you might as well. Um, Were you okay, able to find so, um, Let me uh, tell you, so on September 23rd, um, Dr. Danielle Smith is going to do a presentation called Tools, Tips, and Tips for Creating Dynamic Online Tutorials. Um, and so I'll put the link in for the, the registration for that. Um, October 21st will be myself, Dr. Sarah Evans um, on manga literacy, what more we can get from Japanese comics culture. And then November 18th will be Barbara, Dr. Barbara Schultz Jones doing learning environments, best practices for today, you know, sort of COVID situation. So. Uh, awesome. Okay. I can't wait. Well, thank you guys for coming. It's so nice to see your faces. Oh, <laughs> it's really just a rare treat to see people, period, but all right here together. So thank you for coming and we hope you have a great night and we will see you. Oh gosh, the semester starts on Monday. Oh. <laughs> already so have a good night it's good to see you bye, bye. Okay. i'm gonna go ahead and stop recording <laughs>